Hello, my name is Dr. Julie Parsons. I'm a professor of clinical pediatrics and neurology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in Aurora, Colorado. I'm co-director of the Neuromuscular Clinic at Children's Hospital, Colorado. And today we're going to talk about identifying, diagnosing, and treating patients with later onset spinal muscular atrophy. We will talk about the diagnosis in older adolescent and adult populations. It's important to understand with spinal muscular atrophy that this is a genetic disorder. SMA is an autosomal recessive inherited disease, and it is caused from the lack of survival motor neuron. This is a protein that nurtures motor neurons. All of us should have an SMN1 gene that's located on chromosome 5, and typically, we produce SMN protein. But in patients who have a homozygous SMN1 deletion or mutation, they aren't producing any SMN protein, and this results in the disorder called spinal muscular atrophy. Fortunately, in the majority of patients, there's a backup gene called the SMN2 gene. It's different just in very subtle ways from the SMN1 gene, but typically, we all have between one and eight copies of this backup gene. And because the gene works a little bit differently, unfortunately, there's only about 10% of functional SMN protein that is able to be produced from that SMN2 gene. So when patients are diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy, we look at copy numbers of the SMN2 gene because the higher the copy numbers of SMN2, the more milder disease or phenotype typically we see. Spinal muscular atrophy is described in terms of age of onset of symptoms, disease severity, and the clinical features that we see. Again, if we look, we see that with the more severe phenotypes, that these patients have lower copies of SMN2 copies than patients who have more mild phenotypes. We start with a prenatal presentation or the type zero patients. And these patients really are very severely impaired at the time of birth. They need to have respiratory uh, support. Typically they die under an age of, of a month. The prevalence of this disorder fortunately is low, less than 1% of the cases that we see. The type one patients will have symptoms under the age of six months. And these symptoms include generalized hypotonia, difficulty breathing and swallowing. These patients will frequently have tongue fasciculations. They aren't able to sit independently. They have very poor head control and they're not able to roll over. Life expectancy prior to any disease modifying therapies uh, was less than two years for 95% of these patients. And this is really the most prevalent SMA type. So this is about 45% of the cases that we see. In the type two patients, these patients develop symptoms less than a year and a half of age. And these patients are able to sit, but typically not stand or walk. They present with lower limb hypotonia. Uh, they have tremor or polyminimyoclonus. They're not able to stand independently and may be referred for a developmental delay, although it's very important to understand that spinal muscular atrophy is a disorder of the motor neurons. Uh, so there is no cognitive impairment or intellectual disability in these patients because this is a motor neuronopathy. The life expectancy for these patients is certainly more than a couple of years, and this is about 20% of prevalent cases. Patients who have type 3 SMA are able to stand and walk. They may be unsteady. They have some frequent falls. This is an interesting category because patients may present when they're toddlers, or they may present more when they're latency age. Maybe they're 10 to 15 years of age, but develop that weakness, inability, or problems with walking, difficulty climbing stairs, getting up from the floor, and the majority of these patients really do have this tremor or polyminimyoclonus. Polyminimyoclonus is a more sort of uh, eccentric, non, uh, 
um, uniform kind of tremor that is a low amplitude, high frequency tremor and very, very common in patients with spinal muscular atrophy. These patients typically will have a normal life expectancy and represent about 30% of cases. And then we have the type four patients, which are only seeing about 5% of the cases. These patients have a normal life expectancy. They will walk independently, but over time may develop weakness in their lower extremities. As we can see, the trajectory for these different types of SMA is different based on the phenotype. So if we look at normal neuromuscular development and strength, we can see that the type one patients very rapidly have a decline, whereas the type four patients are, are a slower uh, lack of, of muscle strength uh, and present later in time. Early diagnosis may expedite initiation of treatment before there is substantial motor neuron loss. Once the motor neurons are lost, we, aren't, we don't have the ability to regain function. Uh, so we want to catch the disorder early. Effective and early treatment may allow these patients to more closely follow a normal developmental trajectory. Time to diagnosis really depends on the disease type. So in a CureSMA survey done in 2018, we can see that the delay for time of treatment in the type one patients um, who have the most severe phenotype and the most profound weakness is really very short. Whereas in type three patients, which may include adults or teenagers, it may be years before these patients are actually diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy. So the milder the form of SMA, there's more discrepancy between onset of symptoms and the actual diagnosis. Factors that might lead to a delayed diagnosis in later onset SMA are that a parent or provider may wait and see. They may have a wait and see attitude, which would be, well, all children are different, everybody's different, let's just see what happens. Um, maybe the patient would be referred to a physical therapist, but these patients have a delay in diagnosis because both parent and provider just wanna see what happens. There's delayed referral to a specialist as a result, and certainly in the more mild phenotypes, we see a higher number of investigations prior to a diagnosis being made. There's overlap with SMA and other neuromuscular disorders, making it a little bit less clear about thinking about spinal muscular atrophy. So certainly with type three patients, we think about hereditary sensory motor neuropathies like Char Charcot-Marie tooth disorder, motor neuronopathies, limb girdle dystrophy, and in the type four patients, as they get closer to adulthood, we might be considering ALS or Kennedy disease, which is an X-linked spinobulbular muscular atrophy. Spinal muscular atrophy and limb girdle dystrophies have a lot of overlapping symptoms, making it a little bit difficult to distinguish sometimes. So there's proximal muscle weakness in upper and lower extremities, difficulties running and climbing stairs, getting up from the floor or jumping, standing up from a low seat. There's weakness of the distal muscles, and in chronic cases, we may see pes cavus or foot deformity. So as we think about the differential diagnosis of later onset SMA phenotypes, we want to consider the pattern of disease. So SMA is predominantly proximal muscle involvement, whereas the hereditary sensory motor neuropathies or motor neuro neuropathies um, tend to be more distal. So there's weakness uh, more distally. It's usually more symmetric weakness and very slowly progressive. When we consider a pattern of weakness with SMA, in general, we do consider symmetric weakness with the upper and lower extremities, uh, but there can be asymmetric cases. It's more characteristic for ALS and Kennedy disease to have asymmetric presentation of weakness with bulbar findings and upper extremity weakness as well. Although nerve conduction studies were used routinely uh, prior to genetic testing being more available, uh, we don't do them quite as often now, but for spinal muscular atrophy, we usually expect to have conserved conduction velocities. They may be a little bit reduced. With 
hereditary sensory motor neuropathy or Charcot-Marie tooth disease, we definitely expect reduced conduction velocities. And recall that this is also involves sensory responses being declined, and we do not expect sensory nerves to be affected in spinal muscular atrophy. In Charcot-Marie tooth, we see distal atrophy as well. So with the diagnostic journey for spinal muscular atrophy, the most important thing to think about is just thinking about spinal muscular atrophy as being a possibility in the differential diagnosis. As I said, molecular testing has really replaced EMGs and muscle biopsies, which used to be the standard diagnostic tool for SMA. Now we're able to make a, a, a suspicion of the diagnosis. We're able to do genetic testing. 95% of the time, we will be able to get an SMN1 deletion. The turnaround time for the genetic testing is typically five to 10 days, and we will have confirmed 5Q SMA. Recall that 5% of the time, we will not have a homozygous deletion, and then sequencing may need to be done to try to determine whether or not there's a mutation of that SMN1 gene. If none of these turn out to be diagnostic for SMA, then we have to look at other disorders and do additional testing to try to sort out a diagnosis. So the diagnostic journey for SMA has changed. In a study looking at five tertiary Italian neuromuscular centers um, collecting data from 96 onward, we can see that molecular analysis for type 1 patients is certainly done more frequently than with the type 3 patients. And conversely, electrical studies, nerve conduction studies, EMGs, are done more often in the more mild uh, phenotype patients or the type 3 or 4 patients than they are in the type 1 patients. So the challenge and importance of prompt and early diagnosis for later onset SMA is real. It can be very difficult to diagnose milder forms of spinal muscular atrophy with less severe symptoms that may overlap with other conditions. Adolescent and adults may face a long diagnostic journey compared to children with more severe forms of SMA. It is important to understand that we now have newborn screening, so we're diagnosing patients very early with spinal muscular atrophy, but we still have a prevalent population of older children and adults who have remained undiagnosed uh, because of, of the issues of not necessarily thinking about this as a diagnosis. It's very important to refer patients for genetic testing as quickly as possible to achieve early diagnosis and allow early treatment, which ultimately will improve patient outcomes. Thank you. We'll be talking about an overview of disease-modifying therapies and some available data on their use in patients with later onset spinal muscular atrophy. There are several approved therapies for SMA, and it's important to understand the mechanism of action of these agents. One is called onesemnogene abaparvovec, and this is a gene transfer therapy. As you recall, Patients with spinal muscular atrophy lack the SMN1 gene, and that lack of SMN1 gene results in a lack of production of survival motor neuron protein, resulting in the disorder. Onesemnogene abaparvovac is an agent that is an associated viral vector that contains a transgene that codes for the SMN1, so that the SMN1 gene is actually replaced, and the result is that there is an increase in SMN1 production with improved or preserved motor function. This agent differs significantly from the other two FDA-approved agents, one called Rizdaplam, which is a spicing modifier, and one called Nusinersen, which is an antisense oligonucleotide. Both of these agents actually work on that SMN2 gene and they work to include in the exon 7 in SMN2 production so that the ratio is shifted from non-functional protein 
to functional protein and boosting up production of the SMN protein again, which leads to improved or preserved motor function. So the three different agents work in different ways, all with the end result of increasing the SMN protein to preserve function. Nusinersen was the first agent that was approved, and this is for all patients, 5Q SMA patients, both pediatric and adult patients, so it's approved across the board. This agent is given via intrathecal injection or lumbar puncture. There's a loading period, so the drug is given on days 1, 15, 30, 60, and then quarterly for life every four months. Um, the next is on Asemnogene albaparvivec, which we discussed, and this uh, indication is only for patients less than two years of age at this point. And uh, on Asemnogene is given via a single peripheral IV dose, uh, only again in babies and children under the age of two. Ristaplam has been most recently approved, and currently the approval is for patients who are two months of age and older. Ristaplam is given orally, and it's just a once a day dose. So with these FDA approved therapies, when we look at the therapies and some of the trials that have been done in type one patients, we can see that there really is benefit with all three agents in terms of treatment. So on Asemnogene uh, in the STRIVE study, uh, as we look at outcomes, we look at 59% of patients treated with on Asemnogene who had symptoms were able to sit for 30 seconds at 18 months. While that may not sound very impressive, we know, that, again, by looking at the natural history, that 95% of those patients would not be alive by age two. So this is amazing that we don't see decline in function, but we see some improvement um, in terms of sitting. With Nusinersen, in the trial done for six month, uh, babies that were six months and younger, um, we looked at motor milestone response at 13 months. 51% uh, of the patients uh, had some motor milestone response. And then for Rizdaplam, when we look at independent sitting for five seconds at 12 months, there were almost 30% of those patients who were able to sit. So with every one of these agents in patients who were symptomatic little babies, um, instead of having a decline in function, they actually all improved. When we look at just on a semnogene in an observational study that was done looking at 76 patients, these were type 1 or type 2 patients, 58 patients had been pretreated with nusinersen before they had the on a um, And we look at six months after having the gene replacement therapy, 82% of those patients had an improvement in motor function, which is amazing. It was also very interesting in this observational study that children who were pretreated with Nusinersen actually showed a significant increase in motor function. With Nusinersen in a clinical trial done with type 2 and type 3 patients, we can see that with patients uh, in the CHERISH study who had to have symptoms uh, later than six months of age, so they presented a little bit later. The age was two to 12 years with the average being about age nine. These patients were all able to sit independently, but they could not stand or walk independently. 88% um, of these patients had to just two gene copies, so you would expect a little bit more of a severe phenotype. And with Nusinersen versus the control patients who uh, had some uh, outcome improvement in the Hammersmith score of 26%, 57% had improvement when treated with nusinersen. In adults with type 2 and type 3, an observational study of 139 patients aged 16 to 65 years, you can see, again, amazing. We expect this to be a decline in function um, when we think about spinal muscular atrophy and the degeneration of motor neurons over time. And yet these patients, 16 to 65 years old, all continued to show improvement at each of these age points, both with treatment after six months, 10 months, and 14 months. Um, and so motor function scores were significantly increased at all points compared to baseline. I think an interesting part of this is with Nusinersen is that it takes time, and particularly in older patients and adult populations with the way we measure improvements um, and the improvements are slower. 
uh, and it takes more time for us to be able to actually see some of the positive outcomes. So very reassuring that over time, the effect of treatment continues to improve based on this observational trial. With Rizdaplam, looking at children and adults with type 2 and type 3, um, there's a sunfish trial, which is uh, looking at patients aged 2 to 24 years of age. And when we look at a meaningful improvement in a motor function, it's called the motor function uh, scale, we see that there's an improvement of greater than three points at uh, a year of treatment. So again, this is amazing. It's important with any of these treatments to recall that the copy number really affects treatment outcomes. So the two things that are most important is thinking about the symptomatology and the phenotype at the time of treatment as well as the copy numbers. And obviously those two things are related. So in two trials that were done in pre-symptomatic babies, so these were babies who did not have any symptoms as determined by the investigator at the time of treatment. Nusinersen, or the Nurture trial, uh, lasted at, uh, for about 35 months. And uh, the SPRINT trial with onisemnogene avaparvivac. So what we can look at is to say that the two copy patients didn't do as well as the three copy patients. So there are more favorable treatment outcomes in patients who have higher copy numbers, three, three copies of SMN2, versus the two copy number patients. In Rizdaplam, there's the Jewelfish trial, and that's looking at patients who've been previously treated uh, with other agents, and this uh, is a broad age span of six months to 60 years. The primary endpoint is, is safety. The secondary endpoint is looking at SMN protein in the blood. And very interesting uh, conclusion with the, with the Jewelfish trial, which is currently ongoing, is that in a group of patients who were treated for a year with Rizdaplam, despite being treated with other agents, there was still a median twofold increase in the SMN protein versus baseline. In onisemnogene avaparvivec, there is an ongoing registry uh, called RESTORE, which is looking at patients who've been treated. And uh, if we look at the patients uh, who are in this registry, we can see that the majority of patients have been treated at uh, around six months of age uh, or greater, um, that the next group is in the 12 to 24 month age range. And then there are some patients that were treated who are older than 24 months. And that was really looking at, there was an expanded access program. It was weight-based. So there are a couple of patients that were treated before 24 months of age. But really, the indication and in FDA approval in the United States is just for patients who are under the age of two. And you can see by looking at the distribution of types that the majority of patients treated were type 1 patients. Again, they presented early. Newborn screening is affecting our diagnosis of these patients. And type 1 patients or two-copy patients are certainly the most prevalent, as we uh, learned previously. So there are some other investigational agents that are being tried. And they come in a variety of different categories. And all of these uh, drug trials are based on non-SMN targeted therapies. So retilceptive is a trial really looking at troponin and, and working on muscle force, trying to see whether we can help with the muscle force and decrease fatigue that patients uh, uh, are experiencing. The um, next agent really is looking at uh, the neuromuscular junction. Is there a possibility that because there's SMN protein at the neuromuscular junction that we could possibly affect the acetylcholine and, and make a stronger contraction? And then there are some agents that are really um, monoclonal antibodies looking at the uh, anti-myostatin. Is there a possibility of increasing muscle bulk and muscle size to increase force? So these are non-SMN targeted therapies that are still under investigation. So all of the available data suggests that approved treatments for spinal muscular atrophy improve outcomes in patients who are treated. The therapeutic landscape is changing for all phenotypes of SMA. Available evidence really suggests 
that patients will benefit from treatment irrespective of their disease phenotype. So we've seen in the little babies with the most severe phenotype, as well as into the adults, that we continue to see benefit when a disease-modifying therapy is given. The benefits from treatment are most evident when it's initiated early, before their symptoms that present, or when symptoms are minimal. So the longer we wait, when there's a delay in diagnosis, then our expectations are that we may not get as much bang for the buck. The number of SMN2 copies always affects the treatment outcomes for all approved disease-modifying therapies. So as you saw, even in the pre-symptomatic patients, the SMN2 patients did not have as quick a therapeutic response or sometimes as robust a response as we see in three copy patients. So there is an important distinction uh, that to help set expectations for providers as well as patients in terms of treating with these disease-modifying therapies. Thank you. We'll talk about the natural history of spinal muscular atrophy and how this is changing with disease-modifying therapies. So the natural history of SMA, as we've seen, has different trajectories depending on the phenotype of the patient. In the type 1 patients, there's a very rapid decline of function, whereas the type 4 patients or the more mild phenotype will have a slower decline in function. But do keep in mind that the trajectory is always loss of motor function, loss of strength over time. In the type 1 patients, this is a much more severe phenotype. So these patients will have disease progression that happens much more quickly than the other phenotypes. There is a test called the CHOP and 10, which was designed to look at babies with spinal muscular atrophy. The majority of children who have type 1 SMA do not achieve a score of 40. And so this is something that we use in we, when we're assessing children in trials to see where they measure up. As you can see with healthy babies, by six months of age, these babies have topped out and have the maximum score on the CHOP and 10 of 64. But babies with spinal muscular atrophy type 1 really rarely achieve a score of 40. In terms of the rate of motor decline, again, that varies with disease severity. So if we use that CHOP and TEND and we say, what's a score? What are we looking at in terms of how a baby scores and what their rate of decline is? We can see that in the patients who have more mild phenotype, that their rate of decline will be a little bit slower than the patients who have a more severe phenotype. So motor function declines very rapidly in patients with type 1 SMA. The lower the motor function, the more rapid rate of decline. And prior to disease-modifying therapies, we expected death. For types 2 and 3, there's much more variability. So in patients with type 2 and 3, looking at sitters, walkers, and standers, we can see that there's a variability in these types. There's also a difference in their lung function. So there's a progressive decline of lung function in younger patients with early onset SMA and a relative stabilization during childhood, whereas in patients who have later onset SMA, for instance, the type 3 and type 4 patients who present closer to adulthood, they typically will have normal lung function. We can look at patients' decline in upper limb strength. So even when patients are seated, we are able to actually measure their muscle strength and their use of their upper extremities and their limbs. And we can see that from baseline in patients with type 2 and type 3 SMA, that there still is a loss of strength, both in pinch strength as well as grip strength in these patients over time. It is important to understand as well that sometimes the clinical measures that we use to try to categorize patient types and their rate of decline may not be sensitive to disease progression in the milder SMA phenotypes. So decline in contractile muscle over time um, 
in the absence of changes in, with a clinical measure, we use the Hammersmith, or there's such a slow disease progression in the skeletal muscle of the young adult patients with SMA, despite having stable strength and motor function scores. So in some patients, they will say, this is amazing with treatment. I'm able now to stoop and recover. I can drop something and pick it up. Um, that isn't something that we necessarily can measure. Um, I've had patients say, I can ride in a car now and my head and neck aren't flopping all over. I have control of my neck muscles. And these are things that we wouldn't necessarily be able to say or measure. Or patients who can say, I can now open a door by myself or I can take my dishes to the table myself. So sometimes we're not great about measuring changes in function that are really meaningful to patients. So with the natural history of SMA types two and three, we can see that at all types of SMA, all different ages, that we're always going to see a decline in function in terms of the natural history. So the number of copies of SMN2 and the age at presentation will make a difference in terms of how rapidly the decline occurs. But with sitting, with standing or walking, with walking without support, there's always a continual decline in function without any disease-modifying therapy or intervention. So what's the impact of these therapeutic agents on the natural history of spinal muscular atrophy? We have three agents that have been FDA approved, and certainly we've seen that treated infants with type 1 SMA reach neuromuscular milestones that they would never have reached without treatment. Currently, only nusinersen and risdiplam are approved for use in children older than two years of age, so the data on the impact of these treatments on the natural history of type 2 and 3 are certainly more limited than what we have in the type 1 patients. When we treat with nusinersen, looking at patients who were treated, type 2 and 3 patients who were treated, um, we can see by looking at this graph that nusinersen minimized the loss of motor function in patients with SMA type 2 and 3. Uh, this was based on the Hammersmith motor function scale. And certainly over time, we can see that there's stabilization, perhaps some improvement in patients that are treated with nusinersen, whereas the natural history is a decline in function. In using Rizdiplam in patients aged 2 to 25 with SMA type 2 or seated type 3 patients, we can see that as, the, as opposed to the placebo patients who had a decline in function, patients treated with Rizdiplam had an improvement. So gains in motor function at month 12 were maintained or continued to increase to month 24 on the primary and secondary endpoints. And with patients who were treated with Rizdiplam, we also look at changes in upper limb function. There is a validated score called the revised upper limb uh, module, and that is an application that we use for seated patients with SMA. We can see that patients who were treated with Rizdiplam did have an improvement in function. So all available data suggests that approved treatments for SMA improve outcomes for patients with spinal muscular atrophy, even in the more mild phenotypes. Available treatments are definitely not a cure. They impact and improve the natural history, which is always a history of decline. We look for stabilization of function. If we have an improvement function, we're happy but we really are looking for stabilization. Again, they're not taking away spinal muscular atrophy, but uh, stabilize function. Outcomes are likely to be better if treatment is initiated early. Decisions about when to start treatment are always challenging in teenage and adult patients uh, with reasonable physical function. Treatments have really only been available since 2016. So it's important for us as clinicians to provide feedback to improve understanding of the long-term efficacy and safety of these approved treatments. Thank you.